I think there is some importance, you know, of going through the journey together, but it's also important, I think, to find people who are maybe ahead of you in the journey, or maybe they're behind you in the journey. So having a, a diverse group is super helpful. Do you ever have so many questions and no one to ask, so they're just wasting away on Google searches you'll forget about in an hour or so? We had that same problem, and that's why we created the rd to be podcast, a resource for dietetic and nutrition students looking for answers that their peers don't have. We are students Macy and Emily and registered dietitian Carl Barnes. We engage in conversations and learn from RDs. Join us weekly as we gain insight into the unique journeys of registered dietitians all over the country. Welcome back to another week of the RD to be podcast. I'm your registered dietitian host, Carl Barnes. This is our weekly podcast where we sit down with a different awesome registered dietitian each week to showcase the diversity of opportunity in the field and really dismantle the notion that there's a traditional career path. So each week we're interviewing someone um, and really highlighting how there really is no same path to becoming the dietitian that, that you may be someday. Uh, so we're really honored to be sitting down with uh, Karen Mills today from The Healthy Culture. Um, really excited to hear about your path um, to becoming a dietitian. Thanks so much for being here with us. Yeah, absolutely. I'm very excited. And I'm Jenna, your RD to be. And so, Karen, your first career before becoming a dietitian was actually as a lawyer working in real estate. And so, could you give us a little background into the transition between your first career into dietetics? Yeah. Well, um, the funny thing is, um, like day two of law school, first year, I realized I didn't want to be a lawyer, <laughs> um, which was kind of sad, but uh, I lacked the courage uh, to kind of put the brakes on things and sort of just kind of kept moving forward. And um, yeah, so like 13, 14, 15 years later, whatever it was, um, I actually got laid off from my job. Um, and this was one of those moments of, you know, I really didn't like what I was doing. Um, maybe this is the world's way of just saying, hey, you know, maybe you should consider something else. Um, I came from a family where my grandfather actually owned a wholesale uh, health foods business and which he sold in mm, late seventies, early eighties, right kind of at the height of things. And, um, you know, he had been involved in health foods since the twenties, thirties. So a long time. And so it, health and wellness had always been part of my culture, if you will. Um, and I didn't really realize that there was a profession one could do other than being in a business like his that sold it. And I found that, um, uh, you know, there was this profession that kind of did all kinds of stuff with food and health and wellness. And I'm the type of person who I wake up in the morning, I think about food. Um, I go to sleep at night. What gets me calmed down and going to sleep is like, what am I eating tomorrow? Um, sounds obsessive. Maybe it is, uh, but it's just sort of my personality. So when I found the profession of dietetics, I was like, hey, this could be a thing. So um, that was my sort of aha moment and researched what I had to do and just one step in front of the other and just did it. So Yeah, awesome. And, it's, and it was great how you kind of grew up with it kind of sitting there, but not really realizing you could reach it and go into something like that until you had that like I mean, everything, I, I believe that everything happens for a reason. And it seems yeah. like things definitely paired up so that you could be the registered dietitian that you are today. And so part of your academic background to becoming an RD, you're actually matched to a uh, the St. Louis VA Medical Center um, dietetic internship. And so I'm sure a lot of RD to be's, especially going into dietetics as a second career, they're kind of worried that, oh, I don't have the correct background experience or I don't have the correct like cultivated um same educational experience like other RD to B's going into dietetics. And so what did you do in your undergrad when you were becoming a registered dietitian that made you stand out for such a competitive program? Yeah, it, you know, that was really tough um, because when I went back to school, I was actually a single mom, um, you know, so I had to provide not just for myself, but, you know, for my kids. Um, and unfortunately, it seems like a lot of the path is doing volunteer work. And I did do volunteer work. Uh, and I think the key there was more longevity 
with one particular thing. Um, I worked in a hospital in their food office, essentially, and I did sort of one-off projects. And I devoted, you know, not more than a couple hours a week, but it was something that I did over the course of, gosh, it was probably two years. So I think that was really helpful because it showed commitment to one particular thing. It showed um, volunteerism. Uh, then the other things that I did was I sought out leadership opportunities. So I was a member of the, the board for the Student Dietetic Association. Um, and I think that a lot of programs like to see that you step up to a leadership role. So searching out those sorts of things, I think, is really important. Um, and then the other thing that I did, and this was tough, too, was even though um, it didn't really go a long way towards paying the bills, I did make sure that the jobs that I took were very dietetic or, you know, kind of focused. Um, so I did things like, you know, I worked at a summer camp for kids teaching food nutrition. Um, I was a tutor for um, like a nutrition class and for chemistry you know, don't ask me any orgo anymore because I don't remember it, but I actually did tutor for it. So I knew it at one time. <laughs> um, don't anymore, which is sad, but true. Um, and things like I had a class in my dietetics program that was like the food nutrition or the food service. It's a food service class. And we were placed at different places. And I was at a school that had chart wells um, there managing their food service. And so over the course of the semester, I got to know the director there and I ended up getting a, you know, she needed a project done over the summer. So, you know, I did that. So I, I really sought out those kind of opportunities, um, even though it was really a bit of a struggle. Um, I think that those opportunities kind of helped make me more competitive. And it's really admirable just starting off saying, hey, I was a single mother during all of that process and still doing checking off all those boxes to get accepted into a super competitive program. And it's really great to see it pay off in such a way. And it's just incredibly admirable. And so when you transitioned as a dietitian and you um, got out of the dietetic internship, uh, were there any trans transferable skills as a lawyer that took that you took with you, whether in your dietetic internship or even as a dietitian? Yeah. Um, and actually, I wanted to say something kind of off of the previous. You know, I was lucky. I was lucky that I had a savings account that I could live off of. I was lucky that I had people who could support me. I don't think. I think the road that the path that I took was very hard. Um, and I think that that's, you know, it's something that takes a lot of thought and a lot of planning. And um, I watched some of the people sort of struggle through the path right now. And it, it this is hard. It, it's not, um, you know, you have to find those opportunities and those people who can support you because it, it's a, it's a challenging thing to do. And I was very lucky. I was very fortunate mm -hmm. in a lot of respects. Um, but I kind of want to pay homage to sort of those people, Absolutely. you know, in a yeah. sense, because, you know, it, um, it was a difficult time. And I think that for single mothers, like what I was doing, um, you can do it. It takes some sacrifice, but mm -hmm. you know, you can do it and it's kind of keep an eye on the prize moment so wanted mm -hmm. to give a you know shout out to all the other single moms going down the paths so. absolutely yeah and it's not and it's it's great to say hey you can do it but also there are so many things behind the curtain that you have to take into account live through day by day until you see that finish line and it's just a great message to people out there the great take home is no matter where you are in life, if you want to get somewhere, you can with that support. Of course, you know, mm -hmm. you have support from others, you have the resources, but it's still hard work. And yeah. it's super admirable, just especially with the transition after a career that you knew didn't fit and making that leap into a career that you knew you wanted to do with all those things on your plate. And um when it actually, and then cycling back to that, when it came to that support, was there anything during the time as, you know, a single mother doing all of the right things to get that check off um, on DICAS and into the dietetic internship, was there anything you learned in that process that you kind of have that stuck with you? I know it's kind of like definitely a lot, but. 
Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is tenacity and also choosing your opportunities very, very carefully. I didn't do anything without a reason. You know, I didn't, um, I, I made sure that if I did volunteer, as opposed to taking a paid opportunity, that that volunteer work was going to be specific to what different things were um, looking for. I knew that um, it was going to be super hard for me to pay for an internship, super hard. And, you know, the VA is one of the few programs in the country where you actually get paid, you don't owe them money, you know, which um, I was very focused on that. And I learned, you know, I went to um, the VA had open house events. I went, I met the director, I learned what they were looking for specifically. And I made sure every opportunity that I did, that I took was you know, in that channel, because, you know, I just didn't have time to waste, really. Absolutely. Yeah. And I definitely think a lot of people just try to pick and grab whatever they can. But if they, if they don't have intention behind it, it's kind of like blindly walking in and hoping that you find something. But I think yeah. that's a great thing to take away, especially when you had so many other things on your plate and things to worry about. You had to go in with those right intentions or else it wouldn't have been able to turn out the way that it did. Yeah. And, mm -hmm, and it's just, it's so great to hear that you came out on top. And so, <laughs> um, <laughs> and so when you became a dietitian and back to transferring from a lawyer yeah. to a dietitian yeah. with those skills, is there anything that you took with you as a lawyer that kind of carried you through your internship and as a dietitian? Um, absolutely. And I think you know, all kinds of skills really are transferable. I think probably the most important ones were communication ability, uh, you know, the ability to read, write, speak, you know, all of those sorts of things. I think a lot of professions can kind of uh, set you up for that. But, um, and persuasion, you know, I think we don't think of dietitians as having to be persuasive, but uh, no, you really do have to be, whether it's, you know, you're talking with a patient, you're talking with a doctor, you're talking with, you know, whomever. Um, there's a lot of persuasion that goes into being a dietitian, um, you know, so it's building your case and all of that kind of stuff. So I think that um, a lot of those skills were very transferable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think persuasion, you don't really think about that, but if you have a patient that is really like, stuck in their ways, not wanting to kind of, or close-minded, you know, and especially in whatever situation they're in, you have to have be the cool collected side to be like, hey, but have you tried this? And then yeah. kind of making it actually open up in a receptive way. And with your first career as a dietitian, you worked in clinical and you mentioned that you kind of pretty much worked on every possible floor in a hospital. And yeah. I'm sure that that required a lot of adaptability, a lot of flexibility, but was there a floor that you, or like department of the hospital that you encountered that was like more challenging than others or required a bit more effort to kind of ease yourself into? Yeah, I think that there were two and for very different reasons. Um, one was the ICU, which I loved working in the ICU. That was probably one of my more favorite places to be. Um, but it's very fast paced. It's very um, critical. You know, it is critical care, but it is like everything is time sensitive. You have to know things off the top of your head. You got to be ready to go. You have to be, you know, you work in a multidisciplinary team, but it's like, super, super important, probably, you know, very important. Um, you just really have to be on your game. Um, you know, so it was challenging and intense, but I really enjoyed that atmosphere. Uh, in my experience, at least in the ICU, you were really, really part of the team as a dietitian, and you don't find that on all the, all the floors in the hospital. Um, the other challenging uh, department, if you will, was, um, we had some lockdown psych wards and we had kids units and teenager units and I can't do peds um, of any kind. And uh, I did have to do it in the behavioral health unit sometimes. And for me, that was super, super hard. It just tugged at my heart and um, I found that very, very challenging. And I stay away from peds like it's on fire. It just, I can't do it. <laughs> I don't have the, I'm, I'm too, like, I get all welled up, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm the exact same way. And especially when, like, they're so young and you see them in that environment, it's just, yeah 
because I'm I'm definitely an emotional empath and I mean it has its strengths and it has its weaknesses but I definitely feel like in that environment it can just kind of overtake you especially with what they're going through and so with those two challenging but very separate experiences was there anything you learned from those departments that kind of it stuck with you and carry you with your other careers or jobs you did as a dietitian? Yeah, I mean, the importance of being organized. Um, you know, the reason that I covered so many floors was because my position, I was a full-time floater. Um, so I had four hospitals that I went to, every department, every floor, I worked on every single one. Um, and the only way to do that was I had a binder. And it was like, okay, this is my binder for this hospital, all right, Let's go to the tab for this floor. You know, what do I need to do? What are their procedures? Um, so just being super organized about it was very important. Um, and the other thing is you have to introduce yourself to people. You know, they don't know who you are. They don't know what your role is. They don't know if they can trust you. You know, so the first thing that you have to do is, you know, the day that you're working whatever floor, go in and say, hey, you know, I'm Karen. I'm the dietitian covering this floor. Here's my um, my phone number, you know, let's keep in, you know, let's, this is who I am. I'm your resource, be my resource, please, you know, kind of thing. So um, those things were really important. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And so actually as a floater uh, in a hospital setting there, again, we talked about adaptability and flexibility working on a bunch of floors, but even as a floater in, in different hospitals, because it's a lot of flexibility, just hopping floor to floor in one hospital, but balancing mm -hmm. four, that's a lot. And so again, organization you said was really important, but were there any other tips or things that you did that kind of helped, I guess, keep your ducks in a row other than the organization with having all that in your head, just kind of like separating work-life balance or things like that? Ugh separating work-life balance as a whole other <laughs> um, ball of, uh, of work. Um, but I, yeah, I mean, mostly it was just, you know, the binders and good communication with my boss, you know, and just being um, super, you know, open with, um, you know, she knew my discomfort with, you know, the, the peds. Mm -hmm. So uh, there was one hospital, there are actually five hospitals in the system, one of which was the children's hospital. I never covered there. <laughs> Because <laughs> I'm like, I can't do that. You will find me in a puddle. Mm -hmm. um, so that was just not my thing. But um, yeah, I mean, it was just, you know, really important to kind of just know your schedule, be really conversant with your boss. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my binder of organization and all that was good. I mean, that's kind of what carried me through. Oh, yeah, um, for sure. You know, in, until I got my, um, I, finally, the position I wanted opened up you know, covering the floors that I wanted. So I was able to eventually transition out of it, but. Awesome. Yeah. And actually what you mentioned too, like having to introduce yourself over and over again, when it comes to that interpersonal kind of communication aspect, do you, did you come in already kind of knowing, okay, I kind of know how to do an elevator pitch. I know how to introduce myself, or was it something that you kind of learned as the job went on? Um, I think you kind of develop that skill as the job goes on. It's super scary, you know, when you walk in and, and especially like if they're um, in rounds or something and you have to go up to a group of people who all know each other really well and you're kind of walking up there in your little coat and you got your little stuff all together and you're like, hi, you know, I'm Karen, I'm here, I'm covering today. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the good thing is I did that position for several years. So people, you know, and there were certain areas that I more routinely covered, you know, the folks in the ICU knew me pretty well. Um, because it's not, you can't just dip into the ICU for a week. I mean, that's a little bit more specialized. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there were some floors where they didn't know me as well. So uh, over time you get it, but it's, it is super scary when you start off. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I always thought of it. It's like, you've got your work face, you know, it's like, that's what you do. You kind of like, okay, uh, you know, I'm playing the part of Karen the yeah, exactly. I'm playing the part of Karen the dietitian today, mm -hmm. and you know, here we go. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it kind of helps, like not again with like the separation of kind of not getting into your head too much about it. Just being like, okay, I'm just going in this hospital, this not this personality, but you know, I'm putting on this. Yeah. Uh, situation, you know, and kind of adapting to it that way. And another thing you did, mm -hmm, and another thing you did as a clinical dietitian was you were a preceptor for interns as well. And um, that requires, I mean, you had a lot of skills already beforehand and 
that also requires kind of a communication aspect in a different way, like communication in a way of teaching, but also in like a real life situation. And so with those interns, was there anything you kind of taught them across the board, no matter what their background was? Like, was there anything that when an intern came in, you were like, okay, these are the things that you need to know. I don't even need to talk to you yet to tell you these things. Yeah, absolutely. And actually I'm still a preceptor, believe it or not. I uh, precept now as well. So that's kind of fun. Um, and I'm really happy about that. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, so I think the big things are that um, communication really is key. I mean, I keep saying the word, but it is so vital and it's, it's so important. Um, you know, ask questions. We don't expect you to know everything. We don't really expect you to know very much. You know, you're an intern, you're here to, this is a learning experience. Don't reinvent a wheel. Um, please come and ask me. No question is off the, off the table. You know, just please come ask questions. Um, that was really important. Um, focus on how you write and, well, especially writing, because a lot of what dietitians do actually is writing. So if you think about it, we write chart notes, you know, that are read by doctors, hopefully, um, or you know, if you write articles or you write newsletters, you know, so there is the speaking component, which is when you're talking to um, either in multidisciplinary rounds or you're talking to patients, there's a speaking component of it. But writing, if you don't write well, if you don't write concisely, um, nobody reads your notes. Doctors don't want to read 20 paragraphs of how you got, got there. You know, they want things to be concise. So writing is super important. So, you know, think about it. Um, so there was that. Oh, and also be prepared. There's nothing worse than, you know, okay, I'm going to have a student come in and it's a diabetes rotation and they don't know what diabetes is or they don't remember or they haven't taken the time, you know, prepare, you know, prepare for the rotation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you don't have to know everything. We know you don't know everything, but know at least the very minimal, the basics. Yeah. Um, that's super important. For sure. And that's honestly, because I feel like a lot of people, they don't really know how to prepare because of how daunting mm -hmm. an internship can be. It's kind of like, where do I even start with preparing? But actually mm -hmm. just looking at your rotation, seeing what department you're in, that can just seeing diabetes. That's a great way to just be like, okay, at least know kind of what I'm going into and then kind of working from there. And yeah. so, and it was great hearing that you are also a preceptor now, even as a business owner. And so you switched from clinical dietetics to being a business owner. And so can you tell us how you did yet another career transition from, you know, lawyer to dietitian in a clinical setting to now clinical dietitian to a business owner? Yeah. Um, well, it, it's one of those things. Uh, finally, all the kids left for college. <laughs> <laughs> which is really awesome uh, in, in a lot of ways. And um, my, I, I'm married now. Um, so my husband and I knew that we wanted to move and, once all the kids left. Um, and so we did, we sold everything. We packed up, we moved cross country. It was kind of a wild ride. Um, and I kind of knew that ultimately I would want to work in sort of my own business. Um, you know, working in acute care and, and I did, you know, some outpatient stuff there too. And just, but it's still, it's what I call corporate healthcare essentially. And corporate healthcare comes with its uh, challenges um, because they're corporate healthcare. It's a lot of one size fits all in a, and I know in dietetics, we say one size doesn't fit all it's, you know, individualized care. Yes. Um, however, because it's still corporate healthcare, it means all of your handouts are produced by corporate healthcare. Um, so, you know, I would find myself going into a patient's room in a lower socioeconomic bracket um, and, you know, having a handout that basically was, you know, eat salmon and hummus all the time. And they would look at you like, what? You know, and it's like, oh, man. And, you know, you would try and make some changes within and, you know, you, you could make some changes, but I knew that that wasn't what I wanted to do. I wanted to focus on some other things. And I wanted also to experience sort of the breadth that dietetics has to offer. Um, you know, right now I do a, a lot of community stuff um, and that is super important to me. Um, and, and I have that flexibility, you know, with my own business, I can work pretty much for whomever I want. I get to choose who I work for. 
I get to choose what my projects are. I get to choose all of that. And that's a really good sort of freedom, you know, for somebody like me. Um, you know, but it is quite a process, you know, sort of getting to that point. Um, mm -hmm. I did do a lot of preparation for it. I knew we were going to do this and it was a bit of a leap. Um, so I did a lot of research about what it was going to, what was going to be required. And one thing that really was helpful actually was the Nutrition Entrepreneurs DPG. Um, so it's one of the DPG, DPGs under AND, and um, they have toolkits and webinars. They have so much helpful information, and I use that stuff all the time. Even now, I still use it. Um, and so that was really helpful you know, in understanding what I was going to have to do and some, what some of the steps were. Yeah. Um, oh, and that's awesome because I think it's also a great balance to show of like jumping into something. It's always great to not be afraid to go into it, but also doing research beforehand so that you kind of know what you're getting into because there is that fine line between going in completely blind versus okay, I kind of know what I'm going into, even though you don't really know everything until you do step into it. And yeah. actually, as um, a preceptor now, how has your role as a clinical dietitian preceptor shifted to being a business owner dietitian preceptor? Like, do you teach them different things or like, yeah. And so how does that, Absolutely. <laughs> and so how has that changed? Yeah, um, it's, it's actually changed a lot. It's much more chill, <laughs> which is really nice um, because when you're in acute care and uh, you're a preceptor, it's like, okay, what patients are you going to see? We got, you know, on my, I could have 15 to 20 patients that I had to see during a day and I'm, you know, managing a preceptor. So, or a, a student. So it's like, okay, who am I giving the student to? How to, you know, it's very kind of intense and it's very focused. Whereas uh, here, being a business owner, super chill. Um, you know, we don't have that. What I focus on mostly, um, because I don't see patients anymore, I, I do occasionally, but it's pretty rare. Uh, a lot of what I do is writing and speaking, uh, recipe development, I do things like that. Um, so what I find that um, the students really want to work on, and I ask them what they are interested in. And, um, you know, I give them kind of a Chinese menu to choose from, you know, pick A, B, C, whatever you want to do. Um, a lot of, we work on a lot of writing skills. And so I teach them about things like, you know, what is a pitch? How do you make a pitch? And so a pitch is what you throw out to someone that you want to write an, art, an article for, or you want to um, do a presentation or a speaking engagement. So I teach them about, you know, how do we do a pitch? Okay, how do you write an article? How do you write an article that is going to target a, a particular audience? What are the things that you need to be mindful of? Um, how do you pick imagery to go with that? How do you then, um, you know, how do you do social media? How do you schedule social media? What does that look like? And then I give them kind of a behind the scenes tour of what like my website looks like, you know, so they can see the back end of it. How do you put it together? How do you post things? How do you do all of that? So I kind of show them all that. Um, and then I also talk to them a lot about, you know, what are the steps to set up your own business? You know, um, you need to see accountants and lawyers and, and things like that. You know, here are issues you need to be thinking of. Um, you know, so we talk a lot about that. Uh, so they do have projects that they work on. So it'll be more of a writing project or I'll have them put together a social media post um, or if somebody's interested in recipe development, uh, I'll have them develop a recipe. And then I talk about, well, then how do you find out what the nutrients are? You know, how do you do all of that? How do you put it together? How do you photograph it? The picture of your dish, you know? So it just depends. Um, yeah. It's actually a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. And it sounds like a lot of fun. And it sounds like a lot of stuff that, you know, kind of like undergrad doesn't really, you know, they don't really cover how to make a recipe look pretty or how to design a website on the back end. And you, I see the common theme of being like communication, like written, oral, things like that. And so what made you kind of interested in that aspect of dietetics? Was it something that you kind of discovered in your clinical um, experience or even like back when you were a lawyer, did you just really have a knack for that communication written aspect? Yeah, I mean, I was a transactional lawyer so what that means is that I wrote contracts and I negotiated contracts. Mm -hmm. um, and when you write in a legal setting, you have to be super precise because a misplaced comma changes the entire meaning of a sentence. 
and could have a very bad outcome if you're not careful. So um, writing was a skill that I kind of honed over my years of being an attorney. Um, and it's just something I always kind of felt kind of comfortable with. And I think I can do reasonably well. Yeah. So I think, I think, uh, I think you do a pretty great job. Given, <laughs> like, um, mm, yeah. Cause just like from what you talked about with all the things that you do with an intern, like it was just a list, the never ending list, but never ending list of great information that like a lot mm -hmm. of interns don't get access to. That, right. And that was the thing. A lot of the questions I was getting from the interns was, uh, we're along the lines of, you know, nobody ever taught, you know, how do you do this? How do you get to, you know, what are the steps? And, um, you know, there, there are some great toolkits, some great free information out there about how you go from, you know, point A to point B. Yeah. Um, but it's also different when you have somebody kind of holding your hand a little bit and saying, okay, you know, here's the behind the scenes. This is what it looks like. And, you know, I hope that um, I think they find the experience to be valuable. I hope they do. Oh, yeah. And it sounds like a whole lot of fun. And so with these interns, are they like interns? Um, can they be from a dietetic internship doing an elective or just from someone reaching out to you being like, hey, I want to get some experience? Like, do you get a little bit of both or mainly like interns in their dietetic internship? Um, it's mostly uh, dietitians or interns that are in their their program. Gotcha. Um, and they've mostly been from, there is a, an internship program that's not too far away. You know, it's about an hour away. And so what's great now is everything being on Zoom. You know, we don't ever meet in person. You know, everything is kind of, you know, through Zoom these days. So uh, that's super helpful. Um, and I've had some undergrads reach out to me as well, asking to, you know, shadow or things like that. And I do that, that sort of stuff as well, you know, just so that they can get kind of a feel for things like that. So. Oh yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's a good, it's still great to see that you've transitioned from a clinical preceptor to doing, to being a preceptor, but in an environment that's more flexible, more relaxing and kind of honing in on what you enjoy. And so is there anything uh, other than, you know, the flexibility and kind of relaxed, more relaxed portion of being a dietitian and owning a business? Are there any other aspects of owning a business that you've really enjoyed that you didn't really get in the clinical experience? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is, you know, I get to decide what my philosophy is. And I get to run my business by my philosophy. Uh, and I think that's super important to me. Um, you know, I'm always open to hearing all kinds of things and learning new things and, and growing uh, as a dietitian um, and in many other aspects. But I, I also feel strongly, you know, my experience with corporate healthcare. Um, I just knew that that wasn't what I wanted to, to be. It, it didn't really align super well with a lot of uh, my own sort of philosophies and my approach. Um, so that's, that's really important. And also the flexibility. I mean, you kind of mentioned this, you know, I do get to kind of say what my day looks like. And like this morning, I got an alert that um, the local you pick blueberry place was opening one day only for my favorite type of blueberries. Well, heck, where do you think I was this morning? I was in the fields picking blueberries, you know, and that's not a flexibility that you have in a lot of jobs. Um, so, you know, that's really nice. I get to pick and choose my projects. And, you know, I, I think that that's, that's really important. Um, but it, it can also be a little isolating and it can be, um, you know, it sounds all really great. It, it, in, a lot, in a, a lot of ways, it really is, but um, it can be isolating. And um, I did join something called a mastermind group. And I don't know if you're familiar, if you've heard of mastermind groups. A before. little bit, but you can do, you can go more in depth about it for the people listening who aren't really familiar with it. So Yeah. Um, so like I said, we had just moved here and this happened, what, four years ago? Yeah, about four years ago. And so I attended the local um, dietetic, the state Dietetic Association uh, had their their annual meeting and met some people who were kind of in a similar boat. You know, we're all starting our own businesses. And so we got together and we formed this mastermind group. You know, even though two, there's only four of us in the group, but actually that's really good. Um, two don't live in the same state. Two of us do live in um, the same state. 
And, you know, we meet once a month and it's a great way to sort of, you know, bounce ideas off of people and say, hey, I'm kind of stuck. I'm having a problem with this. You know, have you experienced this? It's just, you know, and if between the meetings, you know, we have problems, we contact each other and it's like, hey, you know, what do you think about this? Or mm -hmm. can you take a look at this? You know, so it's really nice to have that support because when you're on your own, I mean, it's just, you know, me and my cookbooks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that sounds like a great, like you've had support throughout all your careers. And it's great to hear that you have support now, even in those kind of isolating aspects of being a business owner. Mm -hmm. And um, what recommendation would you have for rd to bs or even new dietitians when it comes to like formulating their own mastermind group? Mm. Um, find personalities that you kind of connect with. I think it's not really important that you're all doing the same thing. In fact, maybe it's better if you're not because then you could learn about some different things. Um, uh, I think there is some importance, you know, of going through the journey together, but it's also important, I think, to find people who are maybe ahead of you in the journey, or maybe they're behind you in the journeys. So having a, a diverse group is super helpful. Um, and, and I think too, one thing that's important, um, you know, we've been talking about, you know, having a business and, and all of those sorts of things, this really would have been almost impossible without the foundational experience that I had in acute care. Um, and I think that that is something that's super important because I think that um, without that, you know, I, when you finish your internship, you know, you feel like you know a lot and you do, mm -hmm. you do know a lot. But until you kind of work in a setting, whether it's an outpatient setting or it's an acute care setting or even a long-term care setting, I think that you don't really, you need that experience to get kind of a breadth, um, yeah. you know, because you, you get a little bit of it in the internship, but not nearly to what you're going to get when you go out in the real world, mm -hmm. kind of, you know, and you're not, yeah. you're kind of doing it on your own. Um, so it is super important to have that foundational experience. Um, and then, you know, when you're looking for sort of your mastermind group, having people that kind of come from different areas, you know, that have different foundational experiences helps too. Um, you know, we have one woman who she focuses on Hayes, um, health at every size. We've got one who's, you know, more eating disorders, um, We've got one who, you know, she is super into perimenopause, you know, that's her target audience. Mm -hmm. Although when I met her, she was super into um, families and, you know, family nutrition and kids nutrition, mm -hmm. um, you know, and she has kind of a foundation, you know, in different things. And, you know, so everybody's bringing something different to the table and that's yeah. really helpful. And that's awesome. And actually what you're referencing too, of like having that foundational experience in acute care, there's a lot, like there's that phrase that I'll bet a lot of RD to B's here or dietetic interns here where it's like, oh, you need at least two years of clinical experience before owning a business or, hey, you need at least X, Y, and Z amount of years before you can do this. And so you mentioned a lot of wonderful things about owning a business, like the flexibility, the ability to have your own philosophy do what you want to honor like nutrition and dietetics and so for rd to bs that are really interested in owning a business do you think that they could just go like okay right as i'm done with my dietetic internship i get that rd credential i'm going to own my business or do you mm -hmm. think that they should get like you what you said foundational experience beforehand that it's tough. I, I really think foundational experience is super important. And I know I can see some of my interns when I tell them this, they kind of go, oh, you know, um, a, a slight cringe. Um, I, I do think it's important. Um, that being said, you know, it doesn't have to be an acute care. If you are somebody who's passionate about sports nutrition, go work for somebody you know, who does sports nutrition and, you know, get a little bit more exposure to it because even in an internship, you're not going to get hardly any exposure to it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think it's, it, it is important because, it, you know, like you said, it is foundational, um, but you learn, you're still in a learning phase. You know, that first job is still a learning phase of becoming who you're going to be. Um, you know, and it, like I said, it doesn't have to be in acute care. It could be in community. It could be, um, you know, if you're interested in eating disorders, 
you know, eating disorders is tricky. That's a whole other ball of, of wax. And what you need to do for that is really specialized. And, um, you know, that's hard. Um, some people do focus on pediatrics. You do see a lot of that. You see a lot of folks in the Hayes area. Um, but everybody that I've met, they have had a pretty strong foundation. And, and it, it, it gives you confidence and it gives you a network too. Because if you just sort of kind of go out there, it's like, well, you know, I want to be a Hayes dietitian. And I want to have my own business. You know, without working somewhat in the industry, you lack that network. Can you gain it? Yeah, you can, but you can gain it while you're learning and somebody else is paying you, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, and a lot of people too start their own businesses as side hustles, you know, so that's something to consider too. If you're really passionate about owning your own business, find somebody who's working in the area or whether it's acute care or something else, start your side hustle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because also actually working what you mentioned, working for someone in an area that you're interested in mentorship connection that's an opportunity Absolutely. to get a mentor and also kind of what you mentioned about you learning that pediatrics wasn't your thing I'm sure your experience as a clinical dietitian taught you that it was not an area or field that you wanted to go into and I think another great thing as well is say that you go in and you're like hey I want to be a Hayes dietitian okay you like work a year with under a Hayes dietitian or in that field and you're like oh this isn't really what I thought it was is going to be, or, hey, I found this instead. It, it's kind of the whole, not, it's kind of shifting the, oh, you need two years of clinical to mm -hmm. more so, hey, you just kind of get your feet wet and then go into it. And I think, yeah, it's a good, it's a good way to shift that mindset because I'm not interested in clinical, but I do know that I could learn a lot from clinical. And so it's kind of not closing my mind off of it, but just knowing that it's on the table if I want yeah. to go for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And so with your background as an RD and even as a lawyer, you have a really rich background. You have a lot of experience as a dietitian with your experience as a lawyer and just in dietetics, mentoring, networking, all that jazz. And so is there anything that you would want RD to be's and RDs to know about our profession or that you just wish was kind of spoken about more in our profession? Mm. Yeah, there's, there's uh, a couple areas. Um, Go for it. I, <laughs> um, I think one of those areas is that um, you kind of get told, but until you experience it, you don't really understand how much you have to advocate for your profession. Um, I, I, you hear it in undergrad. You hear it um, in your internship a little bit too, but when you're out there, it's, it's a constant battle, I feel sometimes, uh, for credibility, which it shouldn't be. Um, you know, our competition are health coaches that have done a six-week course. Um, you know, gosh, and they're super, super successful. Uh, but unfortunately, what a lot of them are selling isn't really scientifically based. It's not evidence-based. And um, I knew I was going to have to go out there and be like, hey, you know, I have a, this education and this is why you should listen to me. But um, yeah, I mean, it really is a thing. You, you really are. It's important to advocate for the profession consistently, constantly. Mm -hmm. and, Never and stop. What, <laughs> yeah. In what ways could even as an RD to be advocate for the profession? Do you have any advice for RD to be's or new RDs about ways that they can advocate and kind of, I guess, stand their ground as, you know, scientifically based, you know, credible research, things like that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think anytime the con it comes up in conversation, you know, whether it's with your family or, you know, when friends find out that you're on this sort of dietetics path, you know, oh, you know, well, what about, you know, I hear carbs are bad for you. You know, you can take a moment and educate them on this, you know, and, and, and talk a little bit about why, no, you actually need carbs. Um, but you can also say, hey, you know, if you are really concerned about this, you know, talk to a dietitian. It's important you do talk to a dietitian and not, you know, somebody who bills themselves as a health coach, you know, and here's why, you know, so it's finding those little opportunities that you have to educate people on what an RD is. Mm -hmm. um, and using it, that persuasive aspect that you mentioned as well. It, Exactly, exactly. You know, here's why we are the nutrition experts. Here's what we have to offer and why we're the nutrition experts. 
Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much for spending your time today with us and just talking about your journey as an RD and just so many great little, I like calling them nuggets of knowledge, like just so <laughs> many great nuggets of knowledge that any RD to be can take, whether it's second career, dietetic intern, anything across the board. But thank you so much, Karen, for being here with us. Absolutely. This was fun. <laughs>